Okay, I'm going to start going over uh, the morning review, starting with number one. So uh, this is a limit problem approaching a real number. So we're approaching a real number. First thing we do, just evaluate that expression, right? We just uh, go through our substitution. So even if this is a one-sided limit, I could do that. Change the problem. It was not going to impact our initial step, right? We always just do direct substitution. So zero in for X. Zero over zero. This tells us that that uh, tells us that there's a hole in the graph, but a limit does exist. So we don't just stop there and say the limit um, is, uh, doesn't exist or undefined. We have to keep going. Okay, there's a hole that's blocking our view of the limit. So we have a special method for this. We know that uh, our goal is to find an X in the numerator to match and cancel out because we already know the cause of the hole in the denominator. We're just trying to match up an X, trying to find an X in the numerator. But right now it's kind of hidden from view with the radicals. So we're going to go through a conjugate method. Well, the numerator, but leave the denominator in its factored form. Okay, expand. OK, so want to try to clean up the numerator. Well, the nice thing is that the twos goes away. To the negative two goes away. So now we have that perfect match, right? We were hoping that the culprit of that zero over zero shows up, and it does. That x over x is what's the cause there. So if we can cancel and eliminate those, we can reevaluate, and we should be able to get down to a real number. So. Move the x's, there's a one left over. I'm left with one over square root of two plus x plus root two. We're going to reevaluate. So I changed this problem to be zero from the left, but has no impact, right? We already determined that the limit exists. So if you're sitting at zero over zero, your one side of limits has no impact on your problem algebraically because what we're after, we know that the full limit exists. So the full limit exists, your one side limit will just naturally fall in line with your true limit. There's not going to be any distinction. Okay, so zero in for X. So I have root two plus root two, one root two plus one root two equals two root two. There's no need to rationalize the denominator, but if you do, that's no problem either. They can leave your answer. Okay, any questions with one? Okay. So I want to talk about number two and three um, in terms of how I presented it on the key. I think over the years I just um, found that it's easier to just tell students, hey, if you see anything with continuity, just go through continuity conditions. That gives you a nice structure. You don't have to figure out, wait, what do I do here? What do I do there? If I just go through continuity conditions, um, I'll just be able to get to my answer. And it just has a nice structure to it. We don't have to guess our steps along the way. So that's the same case with number two here. Number two, it says, for x doesn't equal to four, the function h of x is equal to this expression. What value should be assigned to make function continuous? So basically, I see the word continuous is so we're trying to create a situation where the function is continuous. 
So I think naturally, if we just go through continuity conditions, we'll be able to, to make that happen. So I'm going to just step through continuity conditions. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what h of 4 is equal to. So we don't know what h of 4 is, so we can say that first condition is the order pair. h of 4 is equal to, I'm just going to pick a random variable, um, I'll say k, but you can give it any other variable you like. But right now I know that that's the unknown, and I'm trying to figure what that out, uh, figure what that is. Okay, so second condition is the limit, right? If I have to prove continuity, the point has to exist, the limit has to exist. It says for x doesn't equal to 4, so this is the only function we're dealing with, which means that this is the same function on to the left of 4. Less than 4 is this expression, greater than 4 is this expression. There's no need for one side of limit. We already we only have one expression, one function on either side of 4. So I'm going to jump into my limit notation. So now we have a problem within the problem. First things first, evaluate the expression. Let's just see what we have, right? Let's not assume that uh, we know what this is. So 4 and for x, 16 plus 4 is 20. 20 minus 20 is 0. 4 minus 4 is 0. So, okay, so that confirms it. We have a hole. We should be able to get down to our true limit. Factor multiplies to be negative 20, adds it to be 1, so 5 and negative 4. Okay. So the cause of the 0 over 0 has been discovered. We can remove them. Reevaluate our reduced expression. We should be able to find our true limits for and for x. OK, so the limit exists. I want to force continuity, so that means I have to get that third condition to pass. And that third condition is where my point must be in agreement with my limit. And that means the result of my y value has to be equivalent to my whole, my limit. So there's the whole. And if I can set k equal to 9, then I can fill in that hole um, where that limit exists. So I just feel, you know, continuity conditions is just a nice structured way of working through problems without you having to guess what step you should do. Okay, any questions with two? Okay. Same thing with three. It says find the value for constant k that will make the function continuous. So I, I'm trying to force continuity out of this. Okay. So continuity conditions. I know that my c value is at zero. So first condition, does the point exist? So f of 0, looking to see where 0 is defined. 0 is defined with the first piecewise. So it's going to go in for the x squared minus 2. Okay, so there's my point. Second condition, does the limit exist? 
So you see how now I have two different functions on either side of zero. So I'm going to have to evaluate the limit separately, which means I have to rely on one side of limit. So zero from the left, we're going to have to use involve the x squared minus two because less than zero matches with that notation. And then I'm also going to evaluate the limit from the other side of zero. And let's see what they what we get as a result. So if I plug zero in for x, I get zero squared minus two, which is negative two. From the right side of zero, I plug in zero and for x, I get zero plus k, which is k. So in order for my true limit to exist, my one side limits have to be in agreement. And if I'm trying to force agreement on both sides, then k must be equal to negative two. So we can stop once we stumble upon our answer. Okay, any questions with that? Okay, uh, I said to omit number four, you won't see one as messy as that. So here's number five. Okay, so let the function be continuous. So we know no breaks, no asymptotes, no holes. Okay. Guys, I got handouts up here if you want to pick one up. Um, selected values are, are given. So we know that these are order pairs that sit on the graph, but uh, we do know that every point in between is nicely connected, even though we're only seeing a partial picture of the graph. It says, what is the least number of solutions that where the function is equal to one half on the closed interval from one to eight? So in other words, it's asking how many times is the graph is the graph going to cross a y value of one half? So this is kind of like applying IVT. Okay. We're trying to guarantee how many times it hits. And I think the easiest way to do this is just to graph it, right? If I graph every point and if I connect all the points together, right, how many times is it going to is that is a graph going to have to guarantee to cross over one half? Right? And this is kind of like a little bit of IVT where you have um, using the concept of um, you know you can guarantee a value if there's a, a, a y value above and below. But it's easiest to, to visualize it. So let's just plot all these points. Okay. So one order pair is at one negative two. Two, three. Thirty one. Five negative five. And eight seven. So here's my target. My target is at one half. So what is the least number of times that this graph has to touch as y equals one half? I know my graph is connected, so the least number of times I got to connect from one point to the next. So one time, two times, three times, All right? There's no, you know, there could be more than that, right? Maybe there's more dips uh, through that line that we don't that we don't see. But there's no way around hitting the uh, that dotted line three times if I'm going to connect all the dots. Okay. 
Okay, questions there? Yeah. Okay, so IVT is Intermediate Value Theorem. So IVT says that um, I can guarantee a Y value if there's a graph, if my endpoints are above and below that target Y value. So yesterday uh, we did a more traditional problem where if I said, you know, F of X is equal to, let's say, um, X squared minus five, okay? Between, negative one and three. And I guarantee that the graph is going to cross a Y value of one. Okay. So the strategy for this, um, if it's a more straightforward problem, first identify if the function is continuous. We have a polynomial, so the function is continuous. on the interval from negative one to three. This is my target y value. Yes. So it's not polynomial. That's true. Uh, if it's not polynomial, that means it's not continuous. But um, if it's not continuous, it doesn't mean that it, it automatically fails. As long as if there's a vertical asymptote, as long as that asymptote doesn't impact my interval, I can continue with the problem. So if it was, you know, x squared minus five over x plus x minus um, or x minus six, where the asymptote is outside the interval, then we're okay. So just because if it's not a polynomial, it just means that you got to do an additional check to make sure that there's no conflict. But yeah, if it's a polynomial, that means it's you're guaranteed to have continuity with no issues. Okay, so. That's our target. We're trying to guarantee, trying to see if can we guarantee that y value of one. But we're going to use our endpoints to help us out. But these are x values. So what we need to do is we need to plug these points back into the original function, and we want to see if these endpoints sit above and below our target y value of one. So if I plug negative one in, so I'm starting off at a y value of negative four, and then f of three, nine minus five is four. So these are y values now. So the question is, can I guarantee that the graph is going to hit a y value of one? Yes, right? Because I'm starting at I'm starting down at negative four, and the graph is continuous. It's going to reach all the way to a y value of four. So there's no choice but for the graph to hit that y value of one. So that's what, that's what IBT says. IBT says, if my graph is continuous and I have an endpoint above and endpoint below, without looking at the graph, I know my, gr my, my graph must hit the target because of these three, con these three things that I'm able to confirm. Okay. So um, a way that we can write this out uh, to justify IBT is so we can say by IBT, We start with the lower value, which is at negative one. So since f of negative one is equal to negative four, and we know negative four is less than one, and one is less than four, and four is coming from my other endpoint. I can guarantee that I have a y value of one on the interval from negative one to three. Yeah, so intermediate value theorem, again, we're trying to guarantee that intermediate, that middle y value 
just by information about continuity and then the endpoints. We want an endpoint below our target, our endpoint above, so we can force this to be a middle value, intermediate value, we can then guarantee without, without knowing anything else about the graph. Okay, back page. Okay, sorry if it's a little bit grainy here. Limit as x approaches negative three from the left side of negative three. So we just look at the graph, pick a point to the left of negative three, and then move towards negative three and see where it takes us. So I'm picking up, I'm starting at a point to the left of negative three. I'm going to move towards negative three. And the arrow is leading me towards a y value of three. Okay, limit as x approaches negative three from the right side of three. That's a plus there. So from the right side of negative three, it's taking me to a y value of three as well. So one side's approaching a y value of three, the other side's approaching y value of three. They're both in agreement. So I know that my true limit is going to exist, right? Even though the point doesn't exist, the arrows are consistently pointing me to the same y value. So that's enough for me to say the limit is equal to three. Okay. Negative one from the left side of negative one. So I'm going to I'm going to pick a point to the left side of negative one. It's kind of hard to see here. It uh, the graph kind of flattens out right here. So that's part of the graph here. So I'm picking a point to the left of negative one. I'm going to move towards negative one. It's a horizontal line and it's going to hold steady. Leading me towards a y value of negative one. Sorry, positive one. Negative one from the right side of negative one. So I'm picking a point to the on the right side of negative one. It's leading me to a y value of two. So if I want to ask for the full limit, there's an issue, right? These arrows are not headed towards the same destination. They're not pointing to more towards the same y value. There's a disconnect. That's a jump discontinuity. The limit doesn't exist. Okay, next statement, uh, next part, use continuity conditions to justify if the graph is continuous at x equals one. So, um, well, we can tell that the graph is not continuous, right? But we're going to step through using continuity conditions to prove it using um, those statements. So first things first, f of one. Okay, we seek out a point f of one. It's all the way down here at negative five. Does the limit exist? Yes, it does, because if I pick points on either side of one, the arrows are pointing to the same y value. So I can simply say the limit as x approaches one of f of x is equal to one, right? We're, we're stating what we are able to see on the graph. Right. But the third condition is where we're going to run into some trouble, right? There's the limit. There's the point. These are obviously not in agreement. So our third statement will be f of 1 does not equal to the limit. 
And because we see that this is a failure of the third condition, there's a hole in the graph, therefore a removable discontinuity at x equals one. Everybody okay with the with writing out all these um, conditions here? So that means when you get to that third step, don't just say, you know, one doesn't equal to negative five. But write out your full condition notations. Okay, uh, find the k-value that makes the function continuous. And again, continuity conditions. Look at the look at the restrictions though. Let me just point out uh, what you're looking at here. This is a point, and this is a connected piece of this is a, a graph. This is where the graph lives. Okay. So I want to keep stressing out to uh, um, making a, a point that you're if if you're ever trying to find a limit. Your order pair is never going to help you. Okay? It's never going to provide any information that you want um, for limits. So keep that in mind. All right, so again, I'm going to step through continuity conditions. My C value is at negative three. That's the center of my focus there. So G of negative three. It's just telling me it's K, so I can't really plug name three in for K. It's not the same variable, so I'm just left with K. That's my goal. Okay, second condition, does the limit exist? There's no need for one side limit because I don't have two graphs that are defined separately. This is the only graph that's defined on both sides of negative three. We don't look at the point for our graph, for our limit. Okay, first things first, we're not assuming anything. We are going to evaluate the limit. See what we get. I get nine minus three is six. Six minus six is zero. Zero over zero. I know there's a hole in the graph. Keep going. Factor. Reevaluate. Third condition. So the limit exists. Okay. So we haven't found K yet, but we're getting close. We know that the third condition, if I want to force continuity, my point and my limit must be this one and the same. So that means that will naturally set me up to figure out what K is, right? The only way I can get continuity to occur is if K is equal to negative, to negative five. And then we just, just by stepping, stepping through our conditions, we stumble across our answer. That's our K value. Okay, questions so far? Okay, here's number eight. It says find these two limits, so it's really just two problems, um, but I'm going to just put on a separate sheet so I can show all the work. It's going to evaluate this limits, one side limit. All right, so despite the fact that you see a one side limit, what's the first thing that we always do if it's a real number? Yeah, just plug in that, that whole number. Don't 
don't do anything else, right? It's the same first step every time. So let's see. The whole idea is that we want to know what category we're dealing with, right? Right now we don't know. Is it a is it continuous? Is it a whole? Is it a vertical asymptote? But just by plugging in, we can quickly decipher and then we can decide our next step. So three goes in for X. OK, this is very uh, useful information. What does this tell us? OK, there's a vertical asymptote. We know that the full limit. What? Doesn't exist, right? We know the full limit doesn't exist, but we go back to our problem and realize. OK, it's not asking for the full limit. It's asking for a one side limit, so. That means we're choosing between two options, right? We know that if there's a vertical asymptote, the graph is going to branch off to either positive or negative infinity. But from the right side of three, we're still having to decide between, all right, which, what's the graph going to look like? Is it going to look more like this or is it more, more like that? So we, we have to deciding between positive and negative infinity. And this is when we have to rely on what? How do we get to choose between these two options? We can test what? Yeah, decimals, right? So decimals is going to come into play here, right? So the, I know the natural tendency is you want to use the decimals as soon as you see that one side limit, but it's a very specific situation. Only if there's a vertical asymptote, limit doesn't exist, and you're deciding between how the uh, how the behavior of the graph is moving towards that asymptote. So I want to choose a, a point close to three. But on the right on the right side of three, starting on the right, 3.1 is close enough for us to get a good read on our graph. So 3.1 in for X. Feels a little messy to do this without a calculator, but all we care about is whether we have positive or negative values. Okay, so numerator is obviously what? Positive. Denominator, three minus 3.1 is negative. So that's all we need. Positive or negative must be negative infinity. So we know our graph is going to look more like more like this. OK, part B. We have this here. All right. What's different about the, um, the the approach for this problem here? Okay, we know it's infinity. That's different different procedure than real numbers, right? So, how do we um, how do we approach problems where limit is approaching infinity or negative infinity? Yeah, compared degrees, right? Well, compared degrees, but. What is something that is kind of making it hard for us to compare degrees right now? Yeah, we don't. This is not in standard form. This is uh, factored form. So what can we do to make it easier for us to get a, a better read here? Yeah, let's let's expand this out. If I expand this out with all the parentheses, I can clearly see I'm no longer uh, don't have to guess. You know, I guess I could you know can figure it out, but it's just a lot cleaner and easier to match. The degrees and coefficients if if we don't have parentheses kind of clouding our our view okay so but also understand that it's really only the first term that we care about right so if we uh, don't if we don't expand all the way it's okay as long as you get to that highest exponent and that leading coefficient but i'm going to just do it anyway here so two six x squared minus five x squared The first term is most important. The rest, we really don't. It's really not going to make an impact. OK, so what do you see? What do you notice? Degrees are the same. And because the degrees are the same, we take the ratio of the coefficients. 
There's a three in front of the, the numerator x to the fourth. There's a one in front of the new, uh, denominator x to the fourth. We just take the ratio of the coefficients equals to three. Okay, now what if, what if I change this problem? What if this x approaches negative infinity? Is that going to impact how I, how my answer looks? Still the same, right? This is this is just uh, um, a general normal rational function. There's only one asymptote. Doesn't matter if you're going to positive or negative infinity. It's going to hold at three. So we're not going to change the sign. Only if there's a radical in the denominator. Okay, number nine. Um, similar to what we did on the uh, for number two on the first page, we're just going to evaluate the limit first, plug zero in, see what's going on. Okay, I get three minus three, I get zero for zero. There's a whole conjugate method. Foil the top, leave the denominator alone. Three times three is nine. The radical goes away. But here, gotta be careful here. See that negative there? Negative times positive is negative. That negative is gonna impact both the x and the nine. So you do wanna make sure you protect that with a set of parentheses because that negative has to distribute through that expression. So I get nine minus X minus nine. The nines cancel out. I do have a negative X remaining up top. The X's do cancel out, but there is a remaining negative one that we don't want to lose track of. Now we reevaluate zero and for the remaining X. Zero plus nine is 9 square root of 9 is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6. Negative remains up top, so negative 1 over 6. Okay, questions? Okay, let's get to our graph here. I like to start off with order pairs if I can find any. Looks like I don't have any order pair. I have h of six undefined, but that I can't fill in with anything since point doesn't exist. Okay, so maybe I can start with the left side here. Limit x x approaches negative infinity is negative infinity. That means that as I exit the graph to the left, it's going to go down to negative infinity. So I know that my graph is going to just exit off. Uh, without a horizontal asymptote, but then it's going to dip down. So I'm going to connect that later. Approaching negative four from the left side of negative four is negative three. Okay. Anytime I see just uh, the limit involved, I just always want to start with with the open circle. It's a safer way to go. Because later on, I may have to realize that, you know, that I have to e either leave that open circle. It's easier to have open circle in the film later rather than, you know, having a closed circle and trying to erase it. So I just, if I ever see a limit, I just always start open circle. And if there's something else later to tell me to fill it in, then I can fill it in. Okay, approaching negative four from the right side of negative four is equal to one. So that means from this side, I'm going to Try to get towards the y value of one. H of six is undefined. 
Okay, so I'll leave that alone for now. Limit x approaches zero from the left side of zero is negative infinity. So this is telling me that there's a vertical, there's an asymptote here, right? At zero. Dotted line. So that means I want this branch to head down. But it's only telling me from the left side. Uh, it's, telling, it's telling me that the full limit is undefined, so I don't have to show an asymptote on this side. I could make it the same direction or other direction. It really doesn't matter. I can do this if I wanted to. But you can, you know, it doesn't specify, so you can have any option you want on this side. Okay, approaching three from the right side of three is equal to negative four. I don't want to extend too far. I don't know what's going to go on after that. Oh, it tells me that uh, limit uh, from both sides of four must go down to infinity. Okay, so there's a full vertical asymptote here. So I did extend a little bit too far. Um, made it a little bit too close to each other here. So I'm going to adjust this and make this go down. Okay. Here, there's a full limit that exists at 6, 3 from both sides. My graph is going to head towards a y value of 3 on both sides, from both sides of 6. So the full limit exists, so I need to have graph that extends from both sides of the whole. And I do need to leave that as a whole because I go back and I see that, oh, h of 6 is undefined. So leave that as an open circle. And then as I exit the graph to the right, I am going to have a horizontal asymptote and the graph is going to flatten out at negative two. Okay, make sure that our graph doesn't uh, fail the vertical line test. I have one more here. Have you guys tried this one? What if I had a problem like this? So we see it's approaching infinity. But we really can't compare degrees, right? Because uh, these are not the same types of functions. So we got to go through comparative growth rates here. Logs is slowest, followed by radicals, followed by polynomial, followed by exponential. Okay, how would you categorize the numerator? Radical. Denominator. Exponential. Exponential has a variable in the exponent, constant as the base. Okay, which is moving at a faster rate? Exponential. What's going to happen to this fraction? Smaller and smaller and smaller until it goes to zero. And then what if it was the other way around? You got a numerator that's moving faster than the denominator. This is going to get larger and larger, but we still we don't know exactly which direction. It's one of these two options. So to decide between these two, we'll just test the number, head in the direction of infinity, plug in 100, positive over a positive, 
which is positive, so it must be done. 